I want to thank the, organi the organizers and Helene. I apologize that I have a cold. My normal speaking voice is probably clearer than this. Um, so if, <laughs> if at any time uh, I need to slow down, I might if I notice my congestion's inter interfering. So um, I, um, I have nothing to disclose. Um, and what I would do before I get into my presentation is tell you just a little bit about my background so you'll understand when I'm presenting the perspective I come from. Uh, I am a immunologist. Uh, that's what most of my life and research has been. And, um, and prior to beginning research in manual, manual therapies, I was doing cancer immunology research at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, and roughly about 10 years ago, I took a position at an osteopathic medical school called the Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine, which is one of the many uh, schools that we have at the University of North Texas Health Science Center. Um, and the reality is I didn't really know anything about manual medicines at all. Of about 10 years ago before I took this position. And as they brought me in, I came in as an immunologist working with the physiology department that at that time was beginning to do some of the first lymphatics research in manual medicine. And so they trained me and over the years I've turned into what I consider a quasi lymphologist because Dr. Schwartz is a proper lymphologist. I'm an immunologist and, and, a, and, um, and someone who's just started playing with lymphatics in more, just mainly the last five years of my career. But what I'll do is I'll tell you a little bit about where we are with this area of research, some of the research that's been done before, and then I'll end the presentation with some of the work my research lab is, is, has published and is uh, currently working on. So uh, we've heard a bit about lymphedema already this morning, so I won't go into much uh, about this slide at this time, because I think it was covered very well this morning. Um, but I decided to include it just to sort of remind you a little bit about what lymphatics look like, and I'm sure Dr. Swartz will go into much more detail about this in her presentation that follows mine. Um, but if you recall, the lymph, the lymph is basically the fluid that's left over from the blood flow. So as the blood goes into the tissue, the lymph, as this fluid gets deposited into the tissue from the blood, the lymph vessels are there to pick it up. And so the idea is that we, as we release fluid and proteins and other macromolecules that are from the blood into the tissue, the lymphatic vascular system is there to pick this up to bring it to lymph nodes so you have specialized immune cells within the lymph nodes that can respond to these um, per particulate matter, especially if they're uh, pathologic, if they're bacteria or viruses or toxins. Um, and we have fine uh, vessels that are pre-collecting uh, vessels that are capillaries uh, that are very nice in their structure and how they're structured in the extracellular matrix. Uh, that allow them to be able to pick up larger molecules that the blood vessels cannot. So this is a really important um, uh, system that we have in place also to pick up very large molecules that are in the extracellular fluid space in the tissue and take them to the lymph nodes for processing. And I always think a little bit more like an immunologist because I always think about infection and other things that could be going on in tissue and how important the lymphatic system is in draining this so you can have some processing. Um, in lymphedema, there's a lot of reasons why lymphedema occurs, um, and now, as you've heard this morning, a lot of it's secondary to breast cancer, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. There's primary lymphedemas, and there's also lymphedemas related to uh, parasitic infections that you don't see much here in the western uh, part of the world. Uh, but one of the problems is I think of lymphedema as sort of a self-perpetuating cycle. I mean, once it starts, the, lymph the lymphedema feeds back on itself. So the excess fluid in the tissue negatively impacts the lymph itself, the lymph vessels. And here's just sort of an image like we saw this morning, um, just sort of showing you uh, what lymphedema looks like. You've seen several already. So if you think of the fluid in this tissue, this fluid in and of itself is very unhealthy. And it negatively impacts the vessels and it can cause dilation and dysfunction of the natural contractibility because our lymph vessels have their own intrinsic pumping mechanisms that are in place to actually facilitate the movement of the fluid through the vessel. So the vessel has its natural intrinsic ability and then the manual therapies can be added complementary to that and I'll talk a little bit about that later. 
Um, and this is just sort of showing you some of the lymph, lymph, um, lymph node inflammation. There's lots of different things that can cause this. This can also um, impact the lymphatics. And then um, probably what you've probably thought more so is when you have a primary tumor that metastasizes, usually to the lymph nodes that drain uh, the tumor tissue, which we call the sentinel nodes. And it's very important to monitor the sentinel node because it can tell you about uh, the staging and aggressiveness of the cancer. And it's often sampled. It's biopsied. Um, and there's uh, some evidence to support that biopsy might promote lymphedema, but certainly sur surgical excision, radiotherapy, um, and other types of treatments, and even the cancer themselves, um, as they metastasize to the lymph node and damage the lymph node and the vessels along the way can cause disease and result in lymphedema. So just to give you a little bit of, of uh, recap really from this morning, um, so some of the ways that you see this is after a lymph node removal or a lymph adenectomy. Um, so often, again, during surgery, you may have primary tumor, or primary tumor and then sentinel node metastasis, or it may be for staging. Um, and also radiation, chemotherapy, all these things have been shown uh, to uh, be causes of secondary lymphedema uh, that's secondary to usually to breast cancer is where a lot of the research is, but other cancers can also result in secondary lymphedema. Um, as you've already seen this morning, it significantly reduces the quality of life. About 25% of breast cancer survivors have a risk for secondary lymphedema. And there's a lot of conservative therapies. Um, uh, as mentioned somewhat this morning, you heard a little bit about, I'll go more into the manual medical therapies, mainly therapies that are designed to enhance lymph return. Uh, but some of the most common ones fall under a decongestive lymph therapy, which usually includes manual lymph drainage, which is a type of massage, um, exercise, uh, any kind of physiotherapy, pneumatic compression devices. So these are actual uh, devices that are fitted often to the extremities. There was an image earlier today that you saw of one in one of the morning presentations that can cyclically contract on the tissue with the idea of of mechanically pumping um, and allowing for some of the fluid to be moved. And of course, compression garments to prevent the refill of fluid from the tissue, certainly after treatment. However, the evidence-based effectiveness of, of these therapies is really under investigation. And if you talk to people in this field, you'll find a lot of people are divided on how effective they are. If you look in the literature, you can find numerous reports that say limb circumference is significantly reduced with this sort of therapy combined with compression garments. But then you can look and see other studies that are designed very similar that don't have a significant reduction. So it's, it's really up in the air. Uh, at, the, at the clinical research level how effective these therapies are. So there's no pharmaceuticals that are uh, FDA approved uh, to treat lymphedema here in the United States. And so, so patients really need to use these sorts of manual therapies. And there's very specific therapies that are designed, they even often have lymph in their title, like lymphatic pump treatment. Um, and they were designed to promote lymph flow and enhance lymphatic circulation. Um, and so the obvious way we can all do this is through exercise. And there's been uh, numerous animal studies. Dogs love to run on treadmills. And so there's several studies where dogs, uh, their thoracic duct have been, their ducts have been cannulated and they've monitored lymph flow. Also resistance training. Any, any type of movement is actually very good to promote lymph flow. Uh, massage lymphatic drainage, drainage techniques. These are used. Um, up until just recently, we weren't 100% sure that they actually promoted lymph flow because until you cannulate a lymph vessel, you can't really say 100%. Or if you have some sort of lymphatic imaging uh, techniques that you can use. Pneumatic compression devices, as I described before, these are, are um, devices that can be placed uh, on any part of the body that can contract and basically provide a pump mechanism on the tissue. Uh, myofascial release, traction, release of diaphragms, and all of these, again, are designed and thought to remove restriction to the lymphatic vessels. 
through, uh, through the soft tissue uh, massage and, and other types of techniques as well. And then really what we focused on, because I'm at an osteopathic school, and these are the folks that really introduced me to manual medicine, is some of the osteopathic techniques that are specifically called lymphatic pump techniques. And they can be applied to the thoracic cage, the abdomen, around the areas of the spleen and the liver, and uh, the pedal pump. And so I have some images just to sort of show you what these look like in case you do not practice osteopathy. So the thoracic pump, the patient lies supine, the practitioner comes behind them, and um, there's various uh, different ways this technique can be applied, um, and uh, the clinicians, the way that we've been doing it in our research, um, will usually do a succession of, of very quick, rapid pumps, and then push down, and then let the patient have a nice deep breath in, and then do this again. And how f how long the patient has this therapy done to them um, seems to be clinician, clinician dependent. So some will do it very briefly, some will do it longer. So that's another issue we have, at least in the osteopathic research feel is not everybody's applying the techniques the same, uh, the same way or for the same amount of time. So when you look into our research, um, there's so many things varying from study to study that it makes it quite difficult to tie them all together to really try to understand how things are working. Um, we also have um, uh, an abdominal pump technique, and you'll see a lot of this in my research today because this is an easier technique to apply to animals. Um, and this is basically a compression on the abdomen. Uh, and when we apply it in our studies, we do it at a rate of about one per second towards the diaphragm. And so it starts in the human. Um, you'll see some images in the rats. I'm glad somebody already opened that door this morning for me. And usually when I'm the first person to show rat therapy, uh, I get mixed reactions. Um, and, uh, but in the human, it's, it can be applied. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting that ours is a pump, but we've also been doing abdominal massage and see, have seen similar results. So even if you're not pumping in a uh, one per second rate, you can also deep massage the tissue and increase the lymph flow. Um, and then the liver um, and splenic pumps are very similar, but they're applied very specifically to either the, where the spleen is or the liver is. And then the pedal pump, um, this is probably, when I talk to clinicians, this one is next to the thoracic pump is often used. In fact, this one, most of the clinicians I talk to will use this one uh, because it's thought to be a more of a general pump and the patient lies um, and the practitioner basically pushes against them and allows their whole body, with the idea of being that the abdomen and the thoracic cage have a bit of slushing is the word that a lot of people use. I don't think it sounds as scientific as we like, but the idea is that you're getting a lot of a movement uh, and compression on the diaphragm. And interesting in our techniques, um, all the techniques we've been using in our research studies with animals, we have been focusing on techniques that will contact the diaphragm either directly sort of with the doming techniques or indirectly by either compression on the thoracic or abdominal cages. So for those of you who aren't familiar with these techniques, I, I hope this is enough of an overview to make you comfortable. And for any osteopaths in the room, I apologize because I know it's so much more sophisticated than what I just said. So the first thought was um, lymph in general. And if you pump and you call something a lymph pump, it might be a good idea to actually prove that it actually pumps lymph. Um, so this is actually what the University of North Texas Health Science Center, the uh, Osteopathic Research Center, which is housed at our, at our campus, wanted to address, and they were working on this before I joined as faculty. Uh, but before we go into that work, I'll give you a little bit of some older uh, history of how people have studied at least manual therapies and lymph therapies and movement in animals. And uh, so there's been a variety of animals. I say in our profession, sometimes it sounds like a farm because you can find sheep and dogs and rabbits. And I even found a couple papers with goats. Um, but the, the larger animals are, at least in the early times, were preferred because of the surgical um, techniques. 
lymph vessels are very fragile um, and, and sometimes hard to isolate the smaller the animal gets. Uh, so the large animals were often used and for basic physiological studies they were fantastic and, and so these all these animals have been used um, and there's been numerous studies over about 50 years or so where they have uh, had either passive limb rotation or gentle massage. Um, they've even had animals walking around and the key was movement. Any kind of movement would stimulate lymph flow. So in most of these studies, the thoracic duct, which is uh, one of the largest lymph vessels in your body that returns most of the lymph of your body to the blood, was cannulated. Um, and so the flow could be measured directly. But none of these were technically really therapies. These were mostly just some soft contact, tissue contact or rotation, but nothing really designed to mimic what a clinician or a massage therapist or someone might actually use on their patients. And these are more the early studies. Um, there was a, a, a rodent study uh, that, that w used a fluorescent uh, protein uh, injected in the tissue space, the interstitial space, where they basically took rats and put them either into a sham lymph pump or a lymph pump, so we had the sham lymph pump and the real lymph pump, and the sham was just under anesthesia, and the lymph pump was an actual thoracic type pump, um, and I'll show you some animal images as we go along, uh, applied for the same amount of time under anesthesia. And they actually injected this probe into the tissue, and then the animals in the uh, sham group, they monitored how quickly this fluorescent probe, this protein, is a very large protein too, and the idea was the bigger it was, the more preferentially the lymphatics would take it up, to see how quickly it appeared in the blood. And they compared the sham and the actual lymphatic pump rats and found that the probe appeared in the blood of the rats that received lymph pump faster. And they concluded that this uh, pumping technique that they applied to the rat expedited the uptake at least of the probe from the interstitium and delivered it presumably through the lymphatics, notice I say the word presumably, uh, to the uh, to circulation um, and that was basically based on the size of the probe and the knowledge that the, uh, the lymph vessels would be more preferentially taking up this probe. But they did not directly test it. But it was a fantastic paper and we actually used this paper to set up our rodent model that we currently use in the lab. Um, and now we're moving into the sorts of things that have been done at our campus. And uh, so I have a few slides after this that are going to go into a lot more detail and actually show you some data. Um, so I won't spend too much time on these few bullets, but we have proven that exercise thoracic and abdominal lymphatic pump techniques do increase thoracic duct lymph flow. Um, and then some of the work we've been doing in my lab where we're more interested in immunology, it does promote leukocyte release. Uh, as well as cytokines, and we've even looked at nitric oxide release. Uh, so it does seem to have some effect on the immune system. Downstream, during disease, is where we are working now. Um, and if you want to see some of the work we've already published in our disease models, you can look at our work in pneumonia, because we've published several papers showing that our lymphatic pump trip treatment in the rat protects rats with pneumonia, it reduces their bacterial burden. But I will not be speaking about that study today, but, it, but we have several papers. Uh, so if you go into PubMed, you can learn more about those. So let's, um, so let's talk a little bit about the rat. This was the study I just um, talked about. Uh, so, I, so really what they concluded when they used this large fluorescent protein was that um, the, the lymphatic pump treatment that they applied must have enhanced the uptake of the probe by the lymphatic system, again, because of the uh, knowing the size of the vascular capillaries in this large protein, um, they concluded this, though as uh, someone who's been working with lymph, the lymph system directly now, um, you know, it's sometimes hard to say for certain if you aren't actually looking directly at the lymphatics. So that's really where the next study that our university con uh, conducted, which was right before I joined, um, they have a, a phrase in the osteopathic profession. I've said it many, many times, but now I have a cold. So we'll see how well it comes out. How much lymph can a lymph pump pump if a lymph pump can pump lymph? 
Yes, it worked with the cold. <laughs> I've been practicing that this morning just in case. Um, so, so there's lymphatic pump treatments. They're called lymphatic pump treatments. And until 2005, there wasn't a single published study to demonstrate at all that they actually affected lymph flow. So this was a very significant publication. This was done by my colleagues, um, Dr. Fred Downey, who, who's um, most of what you've probably, if you're aware of his research is in cardiovascular research. Um, but over his years at an osteopathic medical school, he started doing more lymphatic research. In this study, dogs were surgically instrumented and they had a flow transducer placed on the thoracic duct. And what this does is it tells us how much fluid is moving across the thoracic duct. So what we can do is we can measure baseline flows, and we can see when the lymph flow is elevated, and, and uh, we can quantify that. And the animals recovered from surgery, and they were divided into three different groups. And so these were dogs, um, and so dogs are easy to get to do, well, relatively easy to get to do treadmill exercise. Let's just say if they didn't like the treadmill, they became a lymph pump animal. And um, so after they recovered from surgery, they were divided into three different groups. So they either had treadmill exercise, um, and I'll go into another paper in a second that has more detail about the exercise studies. Um, the thoracic pump, which was applied um, to the dog in a canine sling, uh, and I, think, I thought I had an image here. Um, there it is. So that's what the sling looks like, just to give you an idea. Um, so, so the dog rests in the sling, and for the thoracic pump, the um, clinician actually uh, comes to the front of the animal and compresses upwards this way. And for the abdominal pump, uh, the clinician sits behind them and compresses on the abdomen up this way. So we'll go back to the other slide. Um, and, and so all three interventions significantly increase lymphatic flow across the thoracic duct. Um, but the greatest increases were seen during the abdominal pump technique and exercise. In fact, exercise produced a, a very robust response. So when we go back to this, um, oh, I guess it's a redundant slide. My apologies. Um, but we'll just go ahead and look at the image. And so as you can see, um, the, the animal obviously is positioned very differently than how patients are treated. So we have to keep these things in mind. These are conscious. And some of the papers I'm going to show you, these animals are under anesthesia. So we, I, we've written a couple of reviews that, that sort of discuss some of the caveats of this research, if you're interested. Um, you can search for us on PubMed. So um, to expand on the exercise research that Dr. Downey's lab was doing, um, they wanted to look at exercise intensity to see if variations in exercise could also augment lymphatic flow. So the flow transducer was inserted, uh, is the previous study. And the difference uh, between this one was there were different types of duration and intensity of exercise. So they ran on a treadmill with speeds that varied from essentially zero up to 10 miles an hour and then in reverse. And they would run at each uh, speed for a minute and then with 15 minutes rest between each exercise. And um, so what they found at the end of that study was that exercise at one and a half miles per hour significantly increased lymph flow. It was approximately 121% higher than what their resting lymphatic flow rate was. And then as you uh, intense, uh, increase the intensity of exercise, the lymph flow increases in response. So as the... Uh, uh, intensity was elevated for the speed on the treadmill, uh, the lymph flow rate went up uh, with the maximal being a, approximately 419%. So that's a 419% fold increase from baseline compared to, uh, this would have been at the 10 miles of, uh, an hour compared to zero. So zero is essentially baseline, that's pre-running. Pre um, in another study, uh, Dr. Downey's group also uh, wanted to look at uh, expansion of the extra extracellular fluid space because we know that this is where the lymphatics are basically anchored. And by expanding the extracellular fluid space, uh, we can see if this has an effect on lymphatic flow. And how this was done was, again, it was the same setup as before with a flow transducer on the thoracic duct. And then these dogs were under anesthesia for this procedure. 
Um, and the, uh, ex the fluid was uh, saline that was introduced intravenously um, into the animals. And what you're really looking at here is, is what we have is before and after expansion of the extracellular fluid space. That's what the ECE is. Uh, so that's a saline, IV saline overload, basically. Um, and then uh, when a lymphatic pump treatment is added on top of that. And so what you can see, oh, sorry. Oh, no, that's my big special slide that's supposed to wow everybody. <laughs> that was premature. <laughs> this is being videotaped, isn't it? Yes. All right. <laughs> and it'd have to be at Harvard, too. If anywhere, I'd have to do something silly. OK. So oh, I did it again. The, the buttons are very close to each other. <laughs> Let's go back to this slide. Now it's just going to be very difficult. Warning to the presenters, as we've seen, the two buttons are very close, aren't they? Um, so, so what you see here, is, this is actually showing you the expansion of the extracellular fluid. Um, so as you can see, if you think of the baseline, just adding the extra saline in increases the lymph flow. And then both of these different sets of animals had lymph pump treatment. And as you can see, so here's a normal animal. Uh, lymph pump treatment increases the flow across the thoracic duct. And of course, when you expand the extracellular space with saline, it also elevates just compared to baseline. And then when you do lymphatic pump treatment on top of that, you can further promote flow. Um, There's also some exercise uh, research done in this paper as well, but I decided for the sake of time just to present this figure. All right, here comes my special slide. So this is about the time I started working with everyone. Um, and uh, because the previous study showed the abdominal lymphatic pump technique had a greater impact on lymphatic flow than the thoracic lymph pump technique, uh, we decided to just focus on one technique for the immunological and then moving into more of the molecular uh, aspects of this study. So the abdominal pump, uh, I'm about to show you a video if you haven't figured that out yet. Uh, what you'll be looking at is on the left side is a just a, some lymph we're collecting into a, a test tube. This is the fluid that uh, I take up to the lab and we do flow cytometry and isolate cells and, and run different types of immune assays on. Um, on the left, it's the base flow rate and then on the right, you'll notice there's a little bit of movement going on and that's during the abdominal lymph pump. And that's really just, just to show you visually. This is the first time I saw the technique and actually saw the lymph flowing. And, it's, it's as simple as you can visually see it, but yes, we do have more quantitative measures than a video. But uh, just to give you an idea of how much quicker, how quickly the, flow, the fluid will start to flow rapidly within, within seconds of beginning the pump therapy. So uh, now we're moving into the work that we did in my lab, and the figure on the left is showing you the thoracic duct uh, leukocyte flux. And what this is, is a combination of the number of immune cells. Is it really only three minutes? Oh dear. The number of immune cells uh, along with the flow rate. So this is the number of immune cells per minute. And as you can see at baseline, it's very steady. And then as soon as we do four minutes of lymphatic pump treatment, you see this sharp rise, not only in the lymph flow rate, but the number of leukocytes. And this is just showing you a breakdown of the different types of immune cells. We didn't see a preferential increase in any cell type. What we saw was all the cells that were baseline were basically being mobilized into the fluid. And because we have a higher amount of fluid, our flux of immune cells is elevated. We, because we apply this to the mesentery, we can, in a separate set of experiments, we cannulated uh, the one of the large intestinal lymph uh, ducts to uh, measure what was in the mesentery. And as you can see, it's a very similar trend that we do start to see a drop uh, partway through the therapy. Um, and again, there is a limited sort of lymph pool. If we pump for a very long time, it really starts to drop because you think about the pool of lymph as well. You need to let the, the tissue resource uh, refill. But as similar as we saw in the thoracic pump, there was no preferential cell type. All the cell types that were present were mobilized. And we also looked at several cytokines, but in a healthy animal, these are really the only ones we found. Um, and what we saw was a similar trend if you think of that, that graph from before, that's really what you're looking at. So it's not just moving fluid and immune cells, but also cytokines and inflammatory mediators that are in the tissue get mobilized. 
And so really what we thought was um, if you can mobilize inflammatory mediators into the circulation, you might be able to stimulate immunity. And there's several different models that uh, are in existence for lymphedema. Um, and even one recent study that shows at least in a rat, you may be able to reduce lymphedema. And there are complications with this because people are concerned about cancer and whether or not this can spread cancer. So this is actually an area we're working in now. And um, there's really no data that suggests that it can promote metastasis through the lymph system. So this is really where we are. We're trying to take our manual therapies that we know promote lymph flow and now put them in animals that have cancer and see if it actually augments cancer. And for the sake of time, um, I'm just going to kind of uh, show you that there are some just two animal studies in mice that show a few missiles directly on tumors that could be dangerous. Um, but if you, if you massage on the side that there is no tumor, it's fine. So the animal can have a tumor on one side and healthy on the other. If you massage on the side where the tumor is, you can see metastasis, but not if you massage on the contralateral side. And so we've developed some small animal models. And since I'm basically on time here, they're telling me to go. It's the same as you saw before. Lymph pump <laughs> increased it in the rat. And uh, so this is really what we're working on now. And our question will be, um, can, can our techniques promote tumor growth and metastasis? Are they protective? Do they promote immune responses? And um, so I won't really go through this, but what I will show you is just so you can see what they look like. These are different techniques that we're using now. And then, um, and so you can see a little bit of our pumps. This is how we're trying to simulate the human. And, um, and this is where I'm going to need to stop, but there's a little teaser of data to show at least with a primary breast tumor, it did not promote tumor growth. Uh, but we're waiting for our pathologist uh, to come back with our staging for our sensor nodes to see. So, um, so everything looks good for our animal models, but really what happens with cancer itself and whether or not enhancing lymphatics or stimulating tissue directly is still up in the air. Um, so I just want to thank everybody that I've worked back with over the years, and of course uh, thank the NIH uh, for funding me, uh, and, and I'm still in the same boat as some other folks, still trying to keep my funding and get more funding. But thank you very much. <laughs>